Having witnessed OLED and quantum dot technology on televisions, I was very much curious to see how it would affect the monitor market. And while it's been around for a little while, the Philips Evnia 34M2 C8600 is my first taste of a real QD OLED. Now it does not come cheap, at least at the time of filming and in the UK, it costs a whopping £1,150. Now for that money, you will find a ultra-wide 1440p panel that runs 175Hz, has got adaptive sync technologies, and also got the Display HDR True Black 400 certification. So in this review, you can see how it compares to some of the alternatives out there on the market, and to see if it's actually worth its price tag. Now before jumping in, I would like to give you a bit of a disclaimer. If you do want to run 1440p at 175Hz, and on a side note, can run up to 10-bit, which is great to see, you will have to be plugged in over DisplayPort or USB Type-C. The latter does also feed up to 90 watts of power delivery, therefore making it useful if you want to simultaneously charge a laptop while also using it. This is because the two HDMI 2.0 ports will limit you to 1440p at 100Hz. Worthwhile considerations depending on how your setup actually is. Now with the monitor connected over DisplayPort to my RTX 3080, I went ahead and did some testing, and I was left absolutely jaw-dropped by the results. First off, when it comes to its input lag, it's not only the lowest monitor that I've tested to date, but it also completely sweeps aside its competitors, in other words, the ultra-wide format. Indeed, I had it objectively tested at 1.7 milliseconds, giving you somewhat CRT performance on an ultra-wide format, something I didn't think I would ever see myself saying. Now you might have noticed that there are two different figures. Indeed, there's one that is recorded at 6.9 milliseconds. Now for some given reason, the manufacturer gives you the chance of disabling low input lag mode. And I'm not really sure why, because there are no inherent disadvantages of having input lag mode enabled at all times. So in other words, you'll want to leave this mode enabled at all times and forget about it, for you to really experience the best sort of input lag there is to get from a gaming monitor. Now while its input lag will leave you very impressed, its response time will absolutely blow your mind. Now via the OSRTT tool, I had the average initial time, which translates to average D to G, tested at 0.86 milliseconds. Now let me just put into perspective how ridiculous this figure is. Most high refresh rate gaming monitors, be it IPS, TN or VA panels, hit roughly two to three milliseconds with the highest overdrive mode, and therefore you will incur some sort of RGB overshoot. Where you can see in this particular case, this QD OLED does not have any sort of overdrive mode, simply because it doesn't need it, doesn't suffer from much RGB overshoot, and yet gives me a sub one millisecond average D to G absolutely mind-blowing. Now for me to visualize the RGB overshoot, or indeed the lack of it, you can see the UFO ghosting test. And indeed, at the three different refresh rates that I tested, I didn't notice any sort of inverse ghosting, be it in terms of the lighter or darker shades. However, you will notice in terms of the motion clarity that it does suffer towards the lower range, although that is no surprise given that the lower refresh rate offers. Although it would have been nice to see an MBR or ULMB mode of sorts to be implemented with this Philips Evnia monitor. It would have left it stand out in comparison to some of its competitors. Nonetheless, this didn't hinder my overall experience while playing a game such as CSGO. Far from it. At 175Hz, I felt that the motion clarity was very impressive, and very comparable to other QD OLEDs or indeed other panel technologies. Now aside from that, I would like to give you my own opinion when it came to using this monitor on a game such as CSGO. And well, what can I say? The overall input lag and response time was absolutely class leading. I'd never experienced anything like it. And that's coming from someone who's tested over 200 different panels and shoved over 2,500 hours on CSGO. I was left absolutely gobsmacked as to how good this monitor was. If anything, the only thing that was hindering me was its overall form factor. 1800R curvature and an ultra-wide format isn't something that I would actually have on my desk, and therefore meant that I was actually finding it a little bit hard to get used to. But putting that aside, when it came to the overall performance of the panel, well, I couldn't fault it in the slightest. Now, the monitor's goodness does not actually stop there, because there's actually a lot more to offer other than hardcore competitive gaming. In this respect, when it comes to more casual gaming, you'll find adaptive sync technologies. And although it doesn't have a native G-Sync module, thus not giving you the full VR range from 1 to 175Hz, but rather 48Hz up to 175Hz, the overall tear-free gaming experience is still very impressive. 
I didn't incur any sort of flickering or indeed black screen issues while running the Nvidia Pendulum demo. Indeed in this respect I've got the RTX 3080 and while connected over DisplayPort I had none such issues. Furthermore, I was able to run Destiny 2 at 1440p at 175Hz with NVIDIA G-Sync and HDR all simultaneously running without any sort of hitches. And this actually perfectly brings me onto its HDR experience, which is absolutely phenomenal. And before jumping into that, I would like to point out that Philips have used a glossy panel, which isn't overly distracting, in other words, while being used in a bright sunlit room, but of course is going to give you a little bit extra reflection in comparison to a matte coated panel. But given the overall HDR experience and given that what glossy panels actually bring to the market, I've got no complaints whatsoever. Now indeed this monitor has got a display HDR True Black 400 certification and it should not be confused with the lackluster display HDR 400 certification. There's a full breakdown on Visa's website which I'll link down in the description below so that you can compare the differences. But what I will say over here that in practice this monitor has got QD OLED technology therefore abiding to a different testing methodology and indeed getting you fantastic HDR. Indeed this monitor's contrast ratio is on parallel and while using this monitor I felt that it is one of the best HDR experiences that I actually was able to attain from other monitors that I've tested. Now granted there are some mini LED HDR 1400 certified monitors which are absolutely mind blowing as well, however most of these also suffer from some sort of haloing or blooming effect. That is not the case with this Philips QD OLED. This actually gives you a phenomenal experience no matter what sort of scenery you're in and therefore further bolsters its overall performance and leads me to believe this is potentially one of the best HDR experiences that I've ever been able to witness. Now while the monitor's performance is seriously impressive, there are certain limitations of OLED technology that you should consider. And here I'm talking about burn-in. Now there are different ways of mitigating burn-in from occurring and manufacturers have implemented different technology. In this respect, the Philips has got something called pixel orbiting, which effectively means that it's shifting the pixels from left and right. And if you were to enable the feature through the OSD, which is recommended, at least according to the manual, you will literally see your desktop shift, which is actually quite interesting. Now aside from this, you have also got something called pixel refresh, which will effectively take 15 minutes to complete. Now you'll get the first pop-up window at 4 hours and then if you were to choose to ignore the warnings it will show up every 2 hours up to the 16 hour mark at which point you'll be forced to do a pixel refresh. Thankfully it can be done when the monitor is powered off or indeed when it goes into standby. So something meaning that you don't have to have any sort of downtime while using the monitor. Now as a little side note, you can disable the warnings if you so wish, in other words from appearing altogether, but therefore you will actually have to keep tab as to when the monitor actually needs a refresh. But given it can be done when it's powered off, it might be something that you might want to consider in order not to distract you on your day-to-day -day usage of the monitor. Now aside from that, you have also got a panel refresh that is a lot more intensive and will take one hour to complete, yet again can be done when the monitor goes on to standby or indeed it's powered off, but it's something that has to be done after 2000 hours of cumulative hours of usage. So again, something worth considering where other monitors out there on the market which do not use QD OLED technology will not require any sort of TLC. Now moving swiftly on, how does the monitor actually look like? Well it has got a 1800R curvature with a glossy panel that runs 1440p on an ultra wide format at up to 175Hz. Indeed it has got QD OLED technology which of course should be pretty obvious already. Now the monitor also has got a dedicated sRGB gamut clamp which you can select through the monitor's OSD, therefore bolstering overall colour accuracy and will be certainly impressive for those people who are doing any sort of colour editing work or video grading. It is worth noting that unlike a lot of Philips monitors out there on the market, it does not actually limit the overall peak brightness. Now via my calibrators I noticed a gamut coverage of 96.8% in the sRGB space and a gamut volume of 102.4%. You can see below how it compares to the sRGB standard. Now the average LTE sat at a stonkingly low 0.85 with a maximum delta of 3.8 and indeed this monitor can be used for some serious colour editing work. Its tested contrast ratio, thanks to its QD OLED technology, is infinity to one. Yes, very much like Buzz Lightyear. As for its measured white point, at 6,504 Kelvin target, it got 6,083 Kelvin at 100%. 
As for the gamma curve, it sits very close to the 2.2 standard, making it very impressive in this department. Now if you're a gamer or you simply want your image to pop a little bit more, you might want to disable the sRGB emulation clamp. And in this respect, on the 6500 Kelvin target, you can see that it's positively affected the gamma coverage and gamma volume of the sRGB, Adobe RGB and DCI-P3 spaces. In fact, you can see below how it compares to the Adobe RGB standard. Similarly, when it comes to the average delta and maximum delta in comparison to the Adobe RGB standard, it sits at 2.18 and 6.7 respectively. As for its measured white point, it's still very impressive at 6,369 Kelvin at 100%, and equally its gamma curve sits very close to the 2.2 standard. Now moving swiftly on, we get onto brightness, and in HDR I recorded a peak of 430 nits, which isn't too bad. However, in SDR it was actually quite disappointing at 239 nits and therefore I actually had to run this at over 80% predominantly while using it in a bright sunlit room. However it does drop down all the way to 13 nits showing fantastic range and therefore making it quite handy for those people who want to use it in a completely pitch black room. Speaking of which, the brightness uniformity of this monitor is absolutely fantastic throughout the board, and it's very much rare for an ultra-wide monitor to get all green, but in this respect, at least on my test and panel, it did. Better still, this monitor doesn't suffer from any sort of backlight bleed. Indeed, due to its QD OLED technology, it means you're going to get fantastic black levels and no backlight bleed whatsoever, no matter which angle you look at. Now moving past these tests, I would like to talk about the monitor's build quality. And as a reminder, it's got a 34 inch ultra wide format that has a 1800R curvature and a glossy panel. Now you have got a three side borderless design, which is actually quite good because it doesn't take as much space on your desk as you might expect. And it's got a relatively thin bottom bezel, which is actually in silver that fits the rest of the design of the monitor. Speaking of which, I really love the fact that Philips has used in part recycled material when it comes to its base. Indeed, the stand does also provide you height, tilt and swivel adjustments, although given its size it can't be pivoted, in other words rotated, which is no surprise. Now when it comes to using the monitor, you will notice that there's some LED lights at the back. Now normally I would slate manufacturers for using any sort of RGB lights because they're usually quite pointless. However in this respect the LEDs are not only bright but also have got the Ambiglo technology. Which for those people who are not aware means that it can effectively portray what you're seeing on your screen towards your wall. And therefore means that it gives you a good sort of extension of what you're seeing. Of course you can disable this effect or indeed customize it. In other words having let's say a regular RGB rainbow or for example it portraying what you're listening to. But but I actually think that most people will potentially side towards using it, in other words projecting what you are seeing in terms of a video. Now this might be a little bit off-putting while playing let's say a Twitch based FPS game like CSGO, however while consuming a little bit more slower content or watching a movie, it's a great way of immersing yourself a little bit more or at least adding a little bit of ambiance in your room. Now on that note, if you do want to adjust the settings, you'll want to go to the monitor's OSD, which can be done via a little joystick button found at the bottom right hand side and behind the monitor. It's very easy to access and provides you a plethora of different options, which are all comprehensively laid out. Speaking of which, you have also got some built in speakers, two 5 watt speakers with DTS sound, which actually sound pretty good, pun intended. However, of course, if you do want better sound, you'll always want to get a set of bookshelf speakers, a set of headphones or a headset or a DAC, because this will give you a far better audio experience. Now aside from all of this, I would like to point out that very much like its competitors, the Philips Evnia has also got a built-in fan. Although unlike its rivals, it's completely inaudible. And that's coming from someone who was gaming on it while not wearing any sort of headphones, and furthermore has also got some sensitive hearing. Now another point to make is that this Philips monitor, unlike some of its rivals, does have a built-in KVM switch. And this is quite handy if you have multiple sources. For example, if you have a laptop and a desktop computer, you can have them plugged into the monitor and equally have your peripherals such as your mouse and keyboard also plugged into the monitor. This means that when you are switching between, for example, the laptop and the desktop computer, you can still use the same peripherals without having to plug or unplug them. So with all that in mind, it brings me on to my verdict. And granted, it's more expensive than some of the alternatives out there, but when it comes to the overall performance and the package that one is attaining with its Philips Evnia monitor, I think it's hard to argue that this is not a fantastic monitor. 
Indeed, it's one that I can actively see myself recommending. It's got a fantastic input lag response time, 1440p on an ultra wide format and also at 175Hz without any sort of frame skipping issues. It's got no sort of VRR flickering and also has got adaptive sync technologies and furthermore has got fantastic HDR thanks to its OLED technology. Just to add the cherry on top, it's got pinpoint sRGB color accuracy. Now given all of this, it's very easy to see myself recommending it, at least for those people who can afford it, which I appreciate I'm not actually one of them that can actually splash out £1,150 on it. But if you can, then you should definitely shortlist this monitor in comparison to some of the alternatives out there on the market. As a result, it gets my Best Buy award. Now speaking of the other alternatives, Adam from PC Monitors actually reviewed the Alienware monitor, and you should check out his detailed review down in the description below. It's a very good alternative to consider, and one you might actually want to look at in comparison to the Philips Evnia, purely because it actually comes in at a cheaper price point, and has also got a native G-Sync module. There's also a non-native G-Sync module variant as well, that you might also want to look at. Now some of them will be down in the description below for your consideration, and I'll be curious to know what you make of this Philips Evnia monitor, given the results that I've shared in this video. Now if you've liked this independent detail review, definitely do consider dropping a like, subscribing and hitting that bell notification, all of which would be greatly appreciated. As such, I've been totally dubbed and I'll hopefully see you in the next one. Take care of yourselves and goodbye.